Welcome. In this lecture, we will introduce the idea of momentum. We will discuss the impulse momentum relation, conservation of momentum, and we will discuss collisions. First, we begin with a dilemma. A 60 kilogram archer stands at rest on frictionless ice and fires a 0 .030 kilogram arrow horizontally at 85 meters per second. With what velocity does the archer move across the ice after firing the arrow? Here is our situation. The archer is 60 kilograms, the arrow is 0 .030 kilograms, the archer starts at rest, and the arrow starts at rest. And then the archer fires the arrow and of course the masses remain the same, but now the arrow has a velocity of 85 meters per second to the right, and the archer has some unknown velocity of some value to the left, and we want to know what that value is. With the tools that we have at our disposal now, we can't solve this problem, so we need to introduce some other tools. First, we denote our values by symbols, so the masses are m, both m1 and m2, and the velocities are v1 and v2 with the additional subscript indicating initial. So this is the initial state of the archer arrow system. And the archer, in this initial state, applies some force, which I will call 1, 2, where this indicates the force of mass 1 on mass 2, or object 1 on object 2. So we're saying that the archer is applying some force to the arrow to the right, which of course is what propels the arrow to the right. But because of Newton's third law, we know that the arrow also applies a force to the archer, but the force is to the left. And again, because of Newton's third law, we know that these forces are equal in their strength, but opposite in their direction. Hence the negative sign, because negative means the opposite direction in this case. And we know from Newton's second law that we can write the total forces as ma. So we have m1a1 equals m2a2. Now I'm going to use a little bit of time here to write things in calculus notation, but don't worry, you don't need to know calculus for this course. I'm simply going to write things using calculus notation to get to a conclusion, and all you need to know is the conclusion. But even so, what we do know is that the acceleration is the change in the velocity over the change in time. So here is the acceleration of mass 1, a change in velocity over the change in time. Now the lowercase d's indicate an infinitesimally small change. So we have an infinitesimally small change in velocity over an infinitesimally small change in time. Now the notation we use for this course is more of an approximation, where it's more of a macroscopic change in velocity over more of a macroscopic change in time. And that's perfectly fine for the purposes of this course, but for the purposes of this specific lecture, I will use a little bit of calculus to get to where we need to go. And the acceleration on the right hand side is this dv2 over dt, which we approximate for this course as delta v2 over delta t. Now we can manipulate our equation so we have both of the ma's or the m dv dt's on the left hand side, and we can pull out the operator, the derivative operator. And again, you don't need to follow along with the math. I'm simply doing this to prove a point and get us to a definition that we will use for this class, but you don't need to know how everything works here. If you've seen calculus before, then you know how this works. And the assumption here, for those of you who do know calculus, is that the mass is constant. If the masses were not constant, then things would be slightly different and I would not be able to immediately pull out this derivative operator. But let's replace now the terms in the parentheses with P1, and P2, a new term, or a new letter that symbolizes a new quantity. And this quantity is the momentum. So P1 is the momentum of object one, and P2 is the momentum of object two. Now we see that though momentum here, which I will have another slide about in a moment, is a new quantity for us, it is a product of two known quantities that we've seen before in the course. It's a product of the mass and the velocity, again, both of which we know. Now everything we've talked about up to this point does bring us a few steps forward, but we still can't solve the dilemma. We'll have to return to this in a little while. So momentum. Now how is momentum defined? Well, we saw its mathematical representation on the previous slide. The textbook calls it 
Inertia in motion, not really my favorite definition. I would just say it's mass in motion. I think mass and inertia are different because mass is just the quantification of the concept of inertia or the characteristic of inertia, whatever you want to call it. And there's perhaps some debate on this. But simply put, the momentum is the mass of our system or our object multiplied by the velocity of that object or system. What do we get from this? We get that an object must be moving to have momentum. Momentum is proportional to mass and velocity. This means that if I increase the mass or increase the velocity, my momentum also increases. And the reverse is true as well. But this also means that two objects of completely different mass can have the same momentum. For example, a slow moving semi truck can have a large momentum just as a fast moving bullet can have a large momentum because momentum is the product of two quantities, the mass and the velocity. Let's return for a moment to Newton's second law, which we've all seen before. Now let's define Newton's second law in terms of momentum. So what is Newton's second law when using momentum? It says that the rate of change of momentum of a system is directly proportional to the net or the external force, or I shouldn't say or, it's the net external force acting on the system. Mathematically, we write this as the net force equals the change in the momentum over the change in time, where here I've used the calculus notation, but approximately we can use the notation we're familiar with, the delta P over the delta T. And for the purposes of our course, we will treat this approximately equal to sign as equal to, again, for our purposes, but technically they are different. So we have the net force equals the change in momentum over the change in time. Now we want to talk about the momentum impulse relation, which stems from Newton's second law and the definition of momentum. So we take this Newton's second law as we have now rewritten it, and we're going to manipulate it. So we're going to multiply both sides by delta T, and then we're going to flip things around. And now we have the change in momentum equals the net external force multiplied by the time interval over which that force is applied to our system. Now we can call the right hand side a capital I, still a vector. Now let's define both sides. As a reminder, the left hand side is the change in momentum, which is simply the final momentum minus the initial momentum. The right hand side is new to us, at least we're calling it something new right now, which is impulse. An impulse is capital I is defined as the net force multiplied by the time interval over which that net force is applied to our system. So the momentum impulse relation says that the change of momentum of a system is equal to the impulse applied to that system. So what are some examples of this? And these examples are taken directly from the textbook. Here is the impulse momentum relationship written more explicitly where we have the change in the momentum on the left hand side and the impulse on the right hand side. So we have final momentum minus the initial momentum equals the net external force applied to our system multiplied by the time interval over which that total force is applied. Let's say we have a truck and perhaps it got out of control, runs off the road and it collides with a stack of hay. The hay is going to apply a force, but it's gonna be a fairly small force, but it may be over a longer period of time than perhaps a wall. And eventually they'll bring this truck to a stop, but the truck is left unharmed. Now let's say that the truck, instead of running into a stack of hay, runs into a wall. Well, the truck is also brought to a stop. So the change in momentum is the same. We had exactly the same non-zero momentum while the truck was out of control. And then after the truck collides with the different objects, it reaches a velocity of zero. A velocity of zero corresponds to a momentum of zero. So in both cases, the truck is brought to a stop. So in both cases, the change in momentum is identical. However, the force applied is different. In the top case, a smaller force is applied over a longer time. In the bottom case, a large force is applied over a small time. Both produce the same change in momentum, but of course the larger force scenario on the bottom is much more dangerous. What about someone who's boxing? The idea, if a punch is coming at you, is not to go into the punch, but to move your head backwards. And why do you do that? Well, one, so hopefully the punch slides off, but also the punch momentum is brought to zero over a longer period of time and a smaller force is applied to your face. The opposite of this would be, 
you bring your face forward into the punch. The momentum of the fist in both cases, or the change of momentum in both cases, is identical, but the forces are different. So the change of momentum is the same, the impulse is the same, but the force applied, the strength of the force is different, and the time interval over which the forces are applied are different. Now let's discuss conservation of momentum. What if the external net force on the system is zero? Well, that means the right-hand side simply becomes zero. Now we have the change in momentum equals zero. So we can rewrite this equation as PF equals PI. We can rearrange, and we say that the initial momentum equals the final momentum. And this is only true if the net external force on the system is zero. This is conservation of momentum. The initial momentum of a system is equal to the final momentum of that same system. And again, I emphasize that this requires the net force on the system to be zero. This is the only time that we have momentum conserved. Remember, conservation in physics means that the initial value of some quantity, in this case momentum, equals the final value of that quantity. So initial momentum equals the final momentum. Let's return to our dilemma. So we have our archer and he's firing an arrow. We have the initial velocity that are given both of them. The archer's at rest and the arrow's at rest. And then the archer fires the arrow. And we have the final velocity of the arrow, but we still don't know the final velocity of the archer. So we have two states. We'll say this is our final state on the right and our initial state is on the left. Let's write our conservation of momentum equation. We're able to use conservation of momentum because the problem statement declared that the ice is frictionless. So this is obviously a simplification. We're ignoring air resistance. We're ignoring the friction of the archer with the ice. But this is an example for how to apply the conservation of momentum equation. So we have the momentum initial in the initial state on the left-hand side, the total momentum in the final state on the right-hand side. And so what do we do? We want to write the sum of all the momenta in the initial state equal to the sum of the momenta of the final state. So on the left-hand side, we have the momentum of the archer in the initial state plus the momentum of the arrow in, in the initial state. On the right-hand side, we have the momentum of the archer in the final state and the momentum of the arrow in the final state. Now, momentum, remember, is the mass multiplied by the velocity. So let's fill in all the Ps with the product. M1V1I plus M2V2I equals M1V1F plus m2 v2 f. Now on the left hand side, we see that it's mass one multiplied by the velocity of the archer in the initial state, but the velocity of the archer in the initial state is zero. The archer is not moving. Likewise, the arrow is not moving in the initial state either. So both terms on the left hand side become zero. Now let's establish a reference frame. So we are working along the x dimension for this problem. So on the right hand side, the left hand side we know is zero. On the right hand side, we will simply write it out in using the x hat vector, the unit vector, to denote the direction of the velocity. So we have in the final state, the archer is moving to the left, which is why we have a negative m1 v1f and the arrow is moving to the right which is why we have positive m2 v2f. Now we can eliminate the x hat because we know that we're only talking about x direction in this problem, so we don't need to carry that ugly x hat thing around. Now, what are we looking to solve for? Of course, we're looking to solve for v1f. So let's just manipulate this a little bit. Put m1 v1f on the left-hand side and m2 v2f on the right-hand side. We are going to solve for v1f. And we have all the values given in the problem that we introduced at the beginning of this lecture. So we'll scoot that over. We'll plug in our values and we get 0.43 meters per second. This is the answer. Using conservation of momentum, we have found the final speed of the archer. And now we can say the velocity too if we want because we know the direction the archer is moving. So the archer is moving with a speed of 0.43 meters per second, but that speed is directed to the left. So the velocity then is 0.43 meters per second in the negative x hat direction, or just to the left, we can say. Let's talk about collisions. There are two types of collisions, the first of which is the elastic collision. Now, what is an elastic collision? It's an encounter between objects in which the total momentum is conserved and the total kinetic energy is conserved. Now, the idea of energy as a concept, and specifically kinetic energy, is something I don't expect you to know at this point in the course. I'll be talking about it more in the following chapter, chapter seven. But in the discussion of this lecture, I will talk about it as if you know it, 
That way, when you come back and rewatch this video in the future, you can just take your knowledge from chapter seven and apply it. That said, let's talk about some examples of an elastic collision. Let's say we have a, I don't know, like a billiard ball of some kind, and it's moving to the right. And then we have another ball, and it's not moving at all. It is at rest. These two balls collide, and the second ball is sent moving to the right, and the first ball is brought to rest. So in this collision, we had momentum and energy transferred completely from ball one, the green one, to ball two, the tan one. It's important to note that in elastic collisions, we assume that there's no energy put into deformation or sound or anything. So this again is an idealized case, except perhaps on the atomic level, but on the macroscopic level that I'm giving examples for, we don't actually have true elastic collisions, but many times we can approximate a collision to be elastic if it's fast enough, and it depends on the situation. So let's just give more examples where we assume that there's no deformation, no energy put into deforming the balls, no sound given off, because sound is just a wave that carries energy outward, pressure wave. So example two, we have our two balls, now they're moving toward each other. They collide and they then move in the opposite direction. Momentum and energy was transferred from one ball to the other ball and sent them off in the opposite direction. Example number three. We have both balls moving in the same direction, but the green ball is moving faster. So the green ball collides with this tan ball, sends the tan ball flying, and they're both still moving, but now the tan one is moving faster than the green one. So the, again, these are just examples of elastic collisions. Now, what about an inelastic collision? Now, this is an encounter between objects in which total momentum is conserved, so that's the same, but total kinetic energy is not conserved. Why? Because the energy goes to other things as opposed to just motion. It's going to go, as we'll see here, into, for example, sound or deformation. So example one, which actually will be the only example, is you have these two trucks. Again, this is from your textbook. And they're rushing toward each other and they have a head-on collision. Boom. So they collide and look at how they've deformed. So energy was spent bending the metal and whatever material these trucks are made out of into new shapes. And it takes energy to do that. So energy is kinetic energy was put into energy of deformation. And so momentum is still conserved. The energy is not. Sound is given off. If you've ever heard a car crash, you know that they're not silent. Two cars don't just slam into each other and no one hears it. So kinetic energy is not conserved here because some of that energy went into deformation. So some of the initial energy was lost and put into deformation. So the final kinetic energy does not equal the initial kinetic energy. Whereas in the elastic collisions in the previous slides, the final kinetic energy equaled the initial kinetic energy. So that's the main difference between elastic and inelastic. Though both have momentum that is conserved, both do not have kinetic energy that is conserved. In summary, we introduce momentum. We discuss the impulse momentum relation, conservation of momentum, and we discuss collisions, both elastic and inelastic. I'll see you next time.